after the recording now it's going so good morning bernie uh, my name is claudio calling you from washington dc uh, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners from the students in Fairfax City, we are very humble and grateful that Bernie Chiravalli accepted our invitation to the show. Uh, growing up in Northern California, Bernie began writing songs at the age of 13. Eventually, Bernie relocated to Los Angeles in 1984, and a chance meeting with Kansas lead singer brought him to the attention of musician David Pack. When Pack left his gig playing guitar with Mike McDonald, um, he recommended Bernie for the position of the rest that they say in the music industry, the rest is history. Bernie, welcome to the show, man. Oh, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me, Claudia. No, no problem. This has been a, a very weird year for everybody with the virus. Um, people lost a job and, you know, touring musicians like yourself can know what's up, can know tour, that kind of stuff. How is this affecting your, your creativity in general? Well, my creativity as a writer, it, it's actually been kind of a, sort of a jolt for me. I mean, I've actually written more um, at home than I've written in a long time, you know, because it's, I can't play live. And, you know, and the subject matter of being isolated and what's going on in our country and our world, it's been kind of inspiring to write for me. So I've, I've written probably a good 30 songs this year and uh, put out two albums actually. Um, so in that sense, it's been positive. Um, I miss playing with Michael and, and the band a lot. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's like the other half of me is, is playing live is really, a, I miss that tremendously. I really do. But I'm making the best of it. Yeah, you had the opportunity compared to other musicians that a uh, musician, as far as I know, they get, get paid a good money when they go on, on tour, right? Making CD, making an album. It's a lot of effort. You need to promote the stuff and uh, uh, you won't see any money right away, right? Right. I mean, yeah. You have the, the, the you know, opportunity. They have a studio at home. You can do your own thing. Many people cannot, right? Can... Yeah. I, you know, I've often said that uh, playing, playing music, I don't really get paid for playing music. I get paid for traveling, <laughs> traveling and staying in hotels and being on buses and being in airports. That, that part is what you get paid for because that's the hard part. The, the playing music is is a joy, especially with the caliber of musicians I get get to play with, like Michael and, and the band. They're they're just so inspiring to me. You know, they make me better. I think. You know? on, on average, how many gigs were you guys doing a year? On average, I'd say about a hundred. You know, a year. So, Probably a hundred dates a year. Oh, with Mac no, 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 not everything with Michael McDonald. You were playing with other people, right? Or now? Uh, you know, I've, pretty much exclusively, I've been playing with Michael for uh, for thirty over thirty years. Um, I've done a little bit with Ambrosia, yeah. uh, a little bit with Michael's wife Amy, um, yeah. um, but mostly Michael. I mean, I've I've purposely kept it that way because. Uh, I want to be available when Mike calls me <laughs> and um, I don't want to be tied up in some other gig where I'm committed to them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Michael's my, Michael's my first choice to play with for sure. Plus you guys been working together, been writing partners for many years. So it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. We're, and we're, we're, and I'm proud to say we're friends, you know, and that's, that's, that means probably the most to me. It really does. Absolutely, yeah. man. Sweet. Were, were you born like in a musical family and how old were you when you began Got your first guitar or playing guitar or trying uh, to play guitar? When I, I'm not, neither, I mean, my parents weren't really musical per se. They, they, uh, my dad played tuba in high school. Yeah. They, they played music around the house a lot. Uh, we always had records playing. You know, my parents had a nice hi fi record player. And yeah. um, so they all, I was always hearing music in the house. Um, and I, I don't know exactly why. I have to talk to my mom about this, but they got me piano lessons when I was nine. I guess somebody told them that I had an ear. And so yeah. I, I took piano lessons from a neighbor, but I, I got bored with it really quick. I didn't, I didn't want to look at the music. I wanted to remember it and memorize it all. And so my, my music teacher said, he's hopeless, you know? And um, so, but then, you know. <laughs> but then the, the Beatles came on, uh, yeah. Ed Sullivan, that's kind of the story of so many musicians from yeah. my um, I saw them and I went, oh, that, I want to do that. Um, and I really actually wanted to be a drummer 
because I, I just thought the drums looked so cool. And uh, but my parents wouldn't hear that. They didn't want any drums bashing around the house. So I said, well, how about a guitar? So they bought me a guitar. And it's kind of where it started, you know, and then I started getting Beatle records. And uh, the first record I really got into, <laughs> it's going to sound crazy, but it was Dean Martin. Uh, really? Yeah. Everybody loves somebody. I mean, I just love that song. I played it over and over and over. And I kind of learned to sing from that record. And, uh, and then, of course, the Beatles and the whole California music scene and the British scene I really got into. Um, so that's kind of when it started. I, I guess I was around 11 or 12 when I got my first guitar. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I started. And then some, a lot of my friends got instruments and we started playing in bands. Probably around 12, 13 years old is when I first started playing in bands. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so between you were in middle school, where you, high school, were you, uh, sorry, personal question, were you a good, 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 good student? It was, was when you told your parents, well, I want to move and I want to give music a try, they were, they were going crazy or they say, well, tr they try it out for a year? Yeah, they thought I was nuts. Um, I, you know, I was, I wasn't great in school. No, I didn't do really good. Um, I, the arts kind of classes, like, uh, you know, English and, and arts and music classes, I did really well in math. I was horrible. Yeah. Uh, anything academic like that, I wasn't very good. But, um, you know, my parents didn't really pay much attention to it until I got a little older, um, until I was maybe 17, 18. Uh, then they started to be concerned, like, you're still doing this, you know, and um, it, it, it didn't go well at first. Um, but as I got a little older and started to do it professionally, they kind of went, oh, he's pretty good, I guess, you know, and maybe he knows what he's doing. And they supported me after that. But yeah, it was kind of a rocky road at first, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, I can understand it back then, a, a, you know, a parent could be worried about their, ch their child's future, you know, being a musician. But they were very strict at school, you know, you need to get B's and, and better in every class or your mom checking your <laughs> your homework I, daily, I, like we do with my son. <laughs> I got a 17 year old boy, that's what. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, you know, I'm, I think we've been more strict with our kids, uh, honestly, but yeah, you know, my parents didn't ride me that hard about school, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I passed everything. I mean, I, I didn't really fail anything. So it just was, like I said, it wasn't really till I, was going to maybe do it as a living that's when they got concerned you know and understandably so but they changed their tune actually my mom my dad's not around anymore but they both supported me for years and years they encouraged me so that well was look at you about look at you now man to look back you have I've been, I've been fortunate i really have i've been i'm really grateful for you know the breaks i've gotten you know it's been nice well you you you're very good. You're very humble and very good. Otherwise, you wouldn't be with Mike McDonald and, and, and all the other bands that you have you yeah, know, play you. or been around with. So, and then, so you were then in Northern California. And then, when were you when you moved to Los Angeles? I think, right? Uh, that was in the early 80s. I'd say 83, 84. We went down. Um, a producer heard us. I can't remember. Steve. God, I should remember his last name. Anyway, he, he brought us down to Los Angeles and we did a whole album down there, um, a band called Page One. And that was, your, that was your band that, after high school? Well, before then, I was in a band called Logos. We were in a Bay Area band, but yeah, then it turned into Page One. And we went down to Los Angeles, cut an album. We actually, and then we decided to move down there because we thought, oh, maybe we can make it down here. And um, we kind of didn't. Uh, we, we played a lot. We, we, we worked a ton, like six nights a week, five sets a night kind of thing. We, we really played a lot. That's when I paid my dues, I'd say. And um, we learned to play, you know, we learned to play in clubs and, but it didn't pan out. And um, I was there for maybe three, four years in Los Angeles and um, almost ready to give it up because it just wasn't going well down there. But we happened to be playing in this club in Newport Beach down in Southern California. And this guy came up to us and said, we had a woman bass player, uh, Flavia. And he, he said, uh, hey, you guys are really good. Uh, my friend is looking for a bass player, a woman bass player for his video that he's doing for a movie. Would you be interested? And we said, yeah, we'll talk to her about it. And 
it turned out to be David Pack from Ambrosia. Yeah. And he was uh, he was doing the soundtrack for um, White Knights with uh, Gregory Hines and Barishnikov. Uh, it was a, kind of a big movie. And David had like a half dozen songs in it. And he wanted to do a, a video with the, and Flavia did the video. And he said, well, if there's anything I can ever do to thank you. And she said, well, as a matter of fact, my, uh, my band member is a great songwriter and we could use some help. So David heard my stuff and really liked it. And he wow. called me and he immediately just took, we, we became friends and David provided me with an eight track analog machine and um, said, man, you need a better machine to make your demos on. And David really, really, really was a big jolt in the arm for me. And, you know, he's, I have huge respect for him. And then he was playing with Michael and, um, and he was going to be leaving Michael's band. He was playing guitar for Michael. And he said, well, I'm going to be, you know, would you be interested in auditioning for Michael? And I'm like, yeah. And, um, and, you know, it's funny because I never, I was, a, I was a fan of the Doobie Brothers, but not like a rapid fan or anything. I knew of their stuff and I liked it. So it was, it came out of left field. I had, it, I just didn't see it coming. And next thing I know, I'm auditioning for the band and I get the gig. And, um, and needless to say, I stayed in Los Angeles because uh, Mike hired me and uh, been with him ever since. You remember, I don't know, maybe you do, maybe you don't, how many people audition audition for that it's, I mean, it, it's very yeah, difficult I imagine, yeah there, right? were, there were there were about a half dozen other players and they were named players one of them uh, was a friend of mine now grant geisman uh, who's a very predominant session player he auditioned so i thought sure he was going to get it sure and, and um i think mike he's very conscious of people's personalities and not to say because grant's a great guy don't get me wrong but he's very conscious about relationships and bands. And um, I think he just felt like I would mix well, you know, not only as a player, but as a person, it just felt right. And we both had a, a mutual love of dogs <laughs> that came up in a conversation saying, well, oh, a dog person, I like this. So <laughs> I'm not saying that got me the gig, but it, it might've helped, you know. That obviously improved the chances, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think it did. It's tough to be a, as I say before, right? So I want to repeat myself. I I like music. I go to shows. I I have the chance to meet meet a lot of people in different small club where I buy the stuff, they sign the autograph, and I have a, a, a huge music collection. But I have no idea how difficult it is for the the band going from town to town, catch a fly, go to bed at three o'clock in the morning, wake up at seven, and go to another gig and and the personality within them, and the spouse are getting involved, it's, it might be very, very difficult, man. It's... It can be, yeah. I, I mean, any job is difficult in its own way. But yeah, the traveling, that's what I said before. It's like, uh, that's what I get paid for is the traveling and the, like you said, early lobby calls and crazy bus rides. You know, it's like many nights, most of the nights when we're on tour, we finish a show at, at 10.30 at night and then an hour later, we get on a tour bus and we drive for eight to 10 hours you know, to the next city. And a lot of nights, a lot of days, the show the next night. So it's all you can do to get sleep. You know, it's it, that that's challenging. And uh, but, you know, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, it's. Um, yeah. So at the time now you begin making a living. Right. So your parents were OK now. They say, well, I this guy's doing okay. It's not that bad. <laughs> you know, and the thing is, like I said before, we, you know, we're out a hundred, uh, you know, we do a hundred shows a day, a year on average. And I don't know what that average is out, how many days. You, you, you we're probably out for five months out of the year, you know, if you, if you added all the days up. Uh, but then I'm home for five, five months. So, you know, it balances out. I, it's, it's okay. You know, I'm, you know, a nine to five, I would have to go to work and, you know, commute every day. So it, it's it's a trade off, but it's fine. And then, uh, and then even before that, you you decided well, when you went to Los Angeles, right? Music, I need to make it right. Otherwise, sort of, you didn't have like a plan B, right? Plan B would be get a job and go mm -hmm. to school, you know, apply to college. And but you say no, I, this music in my stuff. And yeah, it's funny you say that because I I remember being even when I was thirteen, fourteen years old. 
I knew that's all I, I, I went, well, what else could I do? I don't, I don't have any other talents. I guess I could go in the service. Like, you know, like my dad did. I had no idea. I just, I just, I knew in some ways I felt it, it was a downfall, but in some ways I was fortunate because I knew from a very early age that that's what I was going to do no matter what, you know? So I had a determination at a very young age. So yeah, I didn't have a plan B. No, I didn't. <laughs> and then uh, remember the first time you you guys wrote a song with Mike? In Mike, mm -hmm. how many years after? So you you guys were touring a hundred nights a year or so, so. And then how long did it take before you guys you helped him out with the, with the first record and? That came very early, actually. Um, you know, David, I, I stayed friends with David Pack and, yeah. you know, David said, you know, you ought to play some of your stuff for Michael. I think he would like this stuff. But he, he told me, he goes, Mike likes to hear, he likes to hear the music, but don't write any words. Just give him a track, you know, because he likes to improvise on somebody else's music. So yeah. one way of writing. So he goes, you know, just keep that in mind when you're showing. So it was maybe maybe I was in the band for I, I swear less than a year and um I did I did that I, I got the courage and I played it for Mike and he called me and said I really like this you want to get together so he lived in Santa Barbara and I lived in the San Fernando Valley so it was a good 80 miles apart and uh, but he drove down to the valley and came to my apartment and I'll never forget it um I, we had the track and I had my little studio set up in my apartment and he goes, he said, uh, well, let me just kind of sing along to your track. And he put the headphones on and I remember I had a Rolling Stone magazine and he picked it up and he was reading it. And then the music started playing and I'm like, is he going to sing or what? <laughs> and he was reading the magazine. Then the part came around where he was going to sing and he put it down and he started singing these lyrics that he had in his head. And I was Oh my goodness. And um, that was the first time. It was a song called One More Word uh, that, that we ended up, I ended up putting a, uh, an album co uh, called Wedding Can Street. Um, was, I think it was my first album that I did with Chaz Fricktel, but that was my first time writing with Mike. So it, it was very early, very early on. And he was always very receptive uh, to hearing anything I had. And he would often say, let's, we should write together. And so I'd go up to his house in Santa Barbara and we've written maybe over the years, we've written maybe 40 songs together. I mean, a lot. We've written oh, a lot. Oh, that's very impressive, man. Yeah, we, you know, they haven't all gotten used, um, but maybe about half of those have been published, you know, which is, I, he is the most unique, unusual songwriter I've ever worked with. Which, which way? Well, he's just, first off, his lyric uh, reference is just, Sometimes it's hard to know where he's going with a lyric because he's so unusual with his verbiage. I mean, he just comes up with these phrases and you're like, what, what does this mean? It's almost like you're trying to figure out the song as you're writing it. And I think he is too. He just hears these strange, uh, he reminds me sort of Joni Mitchell sometimes. You know, it's, it's very visual, very emotional, very spiritual in a way. Um, and then his phrasing, it's just like, like I'm, I always marvel at the way he'll play keyboard, but his, his singing is not necessarily in sync with what he's playing per se. It's not very rhythmic. Like for me, when I write, I'm, I pretty much stay in the rhythm of the song, which I think a lot of writers do, but Mike, not Mike, it's almost like he has his, the two sides of his brain. It's like, he's thinking vocal and he's thinking keyboard. And they're not necessarily the same, Line. you know, right. but, but it works, it works beautifully. And uh, so he's taught me a lot about writing, not to be so predictable, you know, but he does it in a way where it's natural. You know, he's, he's really, he's really a marvel as far as I'm concerned. Was Mike McDonald sort of famous at the time, right? When you, I mean, before, after the yeah, Dewey Brothers, or with the Dewey Brothers, he, he got some hits already, right? Oh, absolutely. He this was. I mean, I, I started working with him in 1988, so he became a solo artist in 1982. Oh, so okay, he was already doing his solo thing for five, six years when I joined. 
so yeah, he was he was famous. Uh, I mean, it's funny because a lot of people still to kind of didn't know who he was, you know, because you'd go, well, you know, the guy that sings Take It to the Streets or, or Men of an, oh, that guy, you know, he was still kind of becoming famous in his own right as Michael McDonald. Um, but yeah, he was very well known and very, very successful at this point when he was doing his own solo thing, for sure. I mean, he was only in the Doobie Brothers for seven years or something. It, it wasn't it wasn't that long, you know, before he went on his own. And he's been a solo artist for 40 years or something close to it, you know. Wow. Uh, I'm and then I don't know what is an echo there, but um, how long did and then when we, did you release your first record? Were you in the band with him already or before that or? With my record or yeah, or, your, your your stuff, your own stuff, your own. My my first solo record I put out in 1996. Um, oh, so many many years after, right? So yeah, about six six seven years after I was with Mike, I did do a solo. Pro I did a, another project with Chaz Fertel, who was the bass player with Mike. Yeah, was a tremendous talent. Um, uh, we did a, an album called uh, under the pseudonym of uh, Silent Partner. And that was in 1992, we did that project together. And George Pirelli, who was Michael's drummer at the time, played drums on it. It's, it's a good little record, it's not bad. Um, but yeah, my solo, first solo record I put out in 96 when I was with Mike. And there's actually, uh, I think there's some, that's, that had one, oh, well, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if we had a, I had a Mike song in there or not. Can't remember, but uh, can't remember my own records, but. Uh, yeah, and, and and all during that, I'd always write with Mike, and some of the songs we wrote didn't make it to his, so I'd put them on my records, you know, or other people would cut them, you know. So I got you. Are you still friend with uh, David Pack? I, I really like Ambrosia. Yeah, well, of yeah. course, a I'm very a, good band. Yeah. I'm in touch with David. Yeah, we. Uh, I've no. Yeah, David. Every once in a while, we'd play in Los Angeles area. He'd come to the shows and would sit in with us or just hang out with us. Yeah, we're still in touch. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, for me, I, I like so many groups for many different reasons. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm on purpose. I'm always looking for new bands. Mm -hmm. Like when there's on this radio project together, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm always looking for new, 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 new music, new bands. So, although I, I like, you know, Peter Gabriel, Genesis, you guys, Pink Floyd. I'm the same. I'm the same. Play Pat Benatar, you know, Blonde. I have seen so many. I'm always looking for new people, new, new, new people for me, me too, me too. Um, yeah, David, I, I, you know, I'm friends with the guys at Ambrosia too. I, you know, he left the band yeah, and yeah. they're kind of on, they're kind of on the outs, unfortunately. Uh, I wish they would, I think they would be really successful if they reunited because they were very popular. Mm -hmm. And, but I played some gigs with them after David left. Yeah. So, so I, I, I'm friends with those guys. They're all really, really sweet guys. Uh, Joe Puerte, uh, early Drummond, just the greatest guys. Chris North, really good guys. And then there's no way that they can get to, I don't know, there's a lot of I quality. Want, yeah, I don't want to say no way, but it doesn't look that way. They're, they're, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's not good. They, they don't have a good relationship, but you never know, you know, you never know. So after you you audition with Michael McDonald, you know you be, you guys began rehearsing. Do you remember the first gig, the first show? I'm quite sure you remember. You absolutely. Uh, what I remember really vividly was the very first time I my audition. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And and it was at David Pack's recording studio um, in the Valley, in Sunland, California. And I remember going there. And uh, there was no drummer. Uh, it was just it was just Michael, um, Chuck Sabatino, who was the keyboard player, and Scott Plunkett, who was the keyboard player. So it was basically three keyboard players, no bass player either. It was just the three keyboard players and me. And we were in the control room of the studio, so it was kind of an unusual environment. It was it was kind of scary, to be honest with you, because it was very naked, so to speak. And um, and I had listened, to, I had studied the, the board tape, as they call it, the live uh, cassette of their show 
I'd studied it like crazy. So I knew every song inside out. I was prepared, but I didn't know what vocal parts I was supposed to sing. Uh, I, you know, they didn't really specify you're going to take this part or that part. So I just kind of, I knew the lyrics, but I didn't really know which part I was going to take. So the audition came and I said, well, which part should I take? And Mike goes, well, can you grab the top part? And I'm like, oh my God, I was petrified because a lot of his parts were like, uh, what a fool believes those high harmonies. Oh they're, yeah. They're in the stratosphere and <laughs> our, our, our real love, you know, it's like, are you kidding me? And I was always in my bands, I was kind of the lead singer. So I wasn't used to singing backups necessarily. I would do it when I record, but I was not prepared to sing those high parts. And we came to real love and I'll never forget it. I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And I did it and I, I did it, but I didn't, I didn't think I did a great job. I just went, oh man. I said, Mike, I'm sorry, I, 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 that's kind of high for me. And he goes, oh, don't worry about it, you'll get it. You know, as time goes on, you'll get it. So he was already kind of hinting that he liked it, but it scared me because I thought I blew the audition because I couldn't reach those high parts. And, uh, and you know, as time went on, he's right. I did warm up to those parts and I, I sang them. I sang all those high parts. Uh, so that was cool. And then the other thing I really remember was the audition went well. And then we did one rehearsal, one rehearsal with the full band. That was it. And then we went to play. <laughs> and, and I remember hey. that was one rehearsal. That was it. And, and Mike doesn't like to rehearse. He's, he's not a, he doesn't like rehearsals. And um, so I remember after that first rehearsal, we went to grab dinner somewhere. And Mike said to me, uh, we were in his Mercedes. I'll never forget it. And he goes, so uh, have you ever played in front of big audiences before? <laughs> and I went, yeah, I have. Yeah, you know, I've been doing it for years. And because he didn't know much about me, and, yeah. and then he goes, he goes, uh, oh yeah, about the dress code. And I said, yeah, and he goes, there is none. <laughs> he was like, wear whatever you want. So that was it. And then we went. Um, I think the first show we did was in, uh, not San San Antonio. I think it was San Antonio, Texas. And it got rained out. It was it was the third of July or fourth of July, and uh, so we, the the show was canceled that night or postponed. And then we did it the next day. Um, okay, I take it back. It was Ventura, California. That was the second show. Ventura, Ventura, California was my first show, um, and I, it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. It really was. And, and Mike's band, they were all so embracing of me and just really welcoming. And it, it, it was just a beautiful thing. It really was, it really was. Yeah. Although you, you were the only new person to that, that group of people that were playing with him, but I imagine that you guys will do at least a week worth of rehearsal. Well, of course, I don't know anything about your world, but... One day, it was one day. Those guys were already pretty tight I mean they knew the show yeah because uh, they'd been there for a little bit um so I just like I said I studied that tape and they could tell I I was I was ready, ready you know and like I said Mike does not like rehearsals you know when we when we do a new show like if we're if he puts a new record out yeah we'll take four or five days and rehearse because it's, it's new to everybody right. but in that particular case I was just the only one that really needed to, to be studied so yeah. It was scary, but, you know, I, I've been doing it for years, so, I, you know, I was, I was a pro at that point, too, so. Were you, yeah. were you nervous the night before or in the morning, in the morning or evening before the... Yeah, I was nervous, but, you know, I that kind of nervous energy is kind of a good thing. If you're not nervous, you should worry, <laughs> you know, because then, then, then you're, you're being too complacent or too bored. I, I, yeah. I'm always nervous before a show, but it's, it's a good nervous Wow, I was I was looking to um, to I want to shift gear a little bit uh, and then go. I, I went to the website and just to mention a couple of songs and I. Uh, what can you tell me about the Miracle River? How the song came together? Is the one with Judy Collins the first one that you got? It's a yeah. beautiful, beautiful arrangement. There. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really proud of that song. It, you know, it was originally we wrote it for Amy, Mike's wife. That's on her album. Uh, called Journey to Miracle River. 
Um, and uh, Amy, um, we talked, you know, this was about, about early 2000s. Uh, Amy started to express that she wanted to do an album. And, and, and Amy and I were friends because of me playing with Michael. And Amy had a solo career of her own uh, back in the 80s. She put out two albums, I think, on Capitol Records. But then she sort of just retired and didn't do it. But she always had song ideas in her head. And so we started writing together here at my house. And I'm trying to remember how we met John Goodwin. Uh, don't exactly remember how that came about. But uh, John and I and Amy uh, were at Amy's house out in Reaper's Fork here in Nashville. And John is a brilliant poet. And um, we would get together with John when it was the three of us. And John would just come with stacks of lyrics, like poems. And he'd go, well, what about this one? And we'd go, yeah, it's OK. What else you got? And um, then he read, he had a good deal of Miracle River started as a, as, a, uh, as a lyric. And we went, oh, that's beautiful. And so we kind of went, well, what, what kind of a feel did you have in mind for this? So I just picked up my guitar and started playing those chords um, and the rhythm. And I, I wrote all the music to it. And Amy wrote pretty much the melody. Um, and then we all kind of shaped it together. We did it in her cabin. Uh, I'll never forget it. And then, um, and then we cut it later at my house. But then, you know, Amy's views, I, I'm always kind of a little partial to Amy's version because uh, it was kind of the initial version, but let me tell you, when I heard that that, that Judy Collins wanted to do it, I I nearly cried. I mean, because it was, I mean, she's one of my idols, and um, and uh, so that was just a huge shot in the arm for me. And then Michael doing the duet with her was just the icing on the cake. Um, yeah. And then he wrote the original or the the additional out section uh, that he does, like he built this little chorus of the vocals on the end of the that wasn't part of the original song mike came up with that i mean i almost feel like he should be a co-writer in it but um you know we we'd already written the song beforehand but both versions i love and i did i got to meet judy uh back in uh, i don't know i guess that was about five years ago she played here in nashville super sweet lady you know she's like 80 years old or something and she's still well gigging it yeah now she isn't but i've got to see her show and she was just she's just her voice is almost better than ever really 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 great show great stamina great stories just beautiful beautiful person wonderful it's a beautiful yeah if i, I listen to the right the first one on the left i remember i had sort of photographic memory and uh, i listened to stuff like six times last night and i was putting the questions together it's, it, it's the lyrics the arrangement the boy, I mean, it's it's very very well done, right? Very very Thanks. well done. Very Thank you. Yes, they they uh, Judy pretty much copied our arrangement. Yeah, you know, yeah. it, they pretty much stuck to the arrangement, which was flattering, believe me. What about the beautiful child? Beautiful child. Wow. Um, Mike and I wrote that here, in, right in, in the this, house. In, in this house, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's about his son, uh, Dylan. And Dylan was maybe, gosh, I don't know how old he was. He was a young teenager, I think, at the time. And um, Dylan, he, he was he was a handful when he was younger. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, I think Mike was stressed out about it a little bit. But we wrote that together. Mike actually came up with the initial idea on guitar. Um, Mike Mike loves to write on guitar, um, and so we we hashed that out together and. Um, I, I, we that was a, a, we both really contributed equally on that song. Some of the songs that we've written together, Mike has been pretty much the predominant writer, and I help him finish it. But that, for instance, was a very much a 50-50 song. Um, and he originally cut it uh, out at his studio when he lived here in Nashville, and um, he gave it to an uh, an artist named uh, Chris Eddy, and Chris Eddy is a uh, is Dwayne Eddy's son. So I was disappointed. I was like, oh, Mike, I want, I want you to do the song. And sure enough, as time went by, that, that project kind of fizzled out. 
and then Mike brought it back for his wide open record. So I was, I was thrilled, but that song's been around for gosh, 17, 18 years, uh, a long time. And I was, I was, and then we finally got to do it in the live show and man, I, it, it's just so much fun to play that song. It's, uh, it's so different from Mike because uh, it's more rock. It's a little more edgier when the chorus comes in. I could really play power chords, and it's it's a little more theatrical for Mike. And and uh, and I know Mike loves it too. So yeah, that what a gift that song. I, lo I love that song. I really do. Is any of Mike and McDonald kids are musicians at all? Yeah, yeah. Dylan is. Uh, yeah, you should check out Dylan. Uh, yeah. Dylan McDonald and the Avions. Uh, Yeah, they've got two or three albums out. Uh, Dylan's great, but he's nothing like his father. Uh, he's He sounds, and Dylan, if you're watching this, forgive me, but he almost sounds more like Neil Young or or Ryan Adams. Uh, he sounds a little like, to me, like the uh, Jeff Tweedy from uh, Wilco. Yep, yep. Um, it's much more uh, California rock kind of sounding. I love it. Dylan has sang a, on a couple of my records. Uh, sung, sang background parts and then his daughter Scarlett is very very musical but she doesn't do it she's very shy about it but she she's got a beautiful voice uh, right, sang, let me check him out yeah let me she sang on one of Mike's records when she was still a young girl uh, on his Christmas album I, for, I think it's on uh, what's the name of that, that album gosh I can't remember it's it's not in the spirit but it's the one he did later Uh, I'll, I'll think of it, but uh, she sings on it. She just sounds like an angel, and she plays banjo and I think a little bit of ukulele. She's she's very both both his kids are very musical, but Dylan does it more professionally, I think. Uh, uh, but you know, these days it's hard for bands. You know, it's it's, it's a struggle, it really is. Let me, let me ask. You, I don't know how to ask this question, but well, I will ask you though. Mm -hmm. The, the way I think it, is it difficult to to make it on your own being the son of like the kids of Michael McJo Mac, Michael Jordan right the, the, I like basketball right so mm -hmm. yeah I was gifted but the kids were good but average and so is, is it difficult to be the son of Michael McDonald yeah. you know your son if he was a musician or whatever yeah. I think it I think it is I mean from You know, I've really not talked to Dylan specifically about it, but I can tell that, you know, he's like, like I said, his music, his style is completely different from his father's because, you know, you know, and I know sometimes I've seen comments where people go, well, he sings nothing like his father. Well, why should he? Why you should know? you know? Why should he? He's not his father. You know, I mean, look at the look at the Lennons, you know, look at John and or Sean and Julian. I mean, poor Julian Lennon was. I mean, he was totally compared to John and, and it, it was devastating for him, you know, and I can see it's devastating for Sean too, but they both become their own people. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I can, I, I definitely think it's difficult. Absolutely. It yeah. helped you out at the beginning with the first yeah. six months, somebody to give you a chance. Michael McDonald would make a call and somebody would help you out. But yeah, yeah. It get to a point where, well, if you're not good enough, I don't care who your dad is, right? We need to sell record. We need to sell show. And that's right. That's right. right. You're, you're, it, you've got to, you've got to stand on your own eventually. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's not just the name. I mean, the Lennons are a perfect example. I mean, who's bigger than John Lennon? You know. Yeah. So, you know. I, I got some records. Of course, I, I had them. Some Sean and Julian from eighty something. I, 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 he, yeah. he was very good. I had. Well, I, I suppose that when there's John Lennon, the, the fortune of the amount of money. It's so much that you will inherit that 100 million, 200 million, whatever the amount is. Mm. There's no effort and energy to, uh, you know, to go on your own and try to do something because whether yeah. you do something or you don't wake up every morning in the morning, you will have millions on your back. I, I, I think it's That's in a way it's better, better, better to be poor, if you will. That's a good point. I, 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 I think that too, because, you know, I, it was always a struggle for me, you know, you, and, and I think you, when you're more hungry for it, of uh, course, yeah. you, go, you go after it. Um, but yeah, I, I like, uh, I, I actually like uh, Sean, Sean Lennon's uh, 
friendly fire record a lot i think you know, oh, yeah, yeah and he now he's 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 doing some really edgy different thing kind of things you know i got got to hand it to him he's really uh become his own musician um and he avoids being in his dad's spotlight you know of course you know? but yeah if you got millions of dollars in the bank and you you've got a, a safety net you know i could see where the motivation could be a, an issue you know but yeah uh, yeah i'm a i'm a as you know, right, with my accent, I'm an immigrant. So it's, it's uh, although I, I, you know, my, my parents did okay in South America. When I came here, I was on my own. And it was one day I will tell you, no, no, the recording, but my story. But it's, I got, people helped me out on the way. I got lucky too, but I, I work like a dog I mean, to, sure. to, to where I am right now and yeah. the schooling and my profession and kind of stuff. So. Yeah, that's, that's a good thing now. It's, it's a very good thing. I mean, it's, it's terrible that parents give everything to the kids. And, uh, uh, we're kind of in that sort of day and age right now, you know. You need, you need, you need to earn that, like I did, like I, they did, you know. I agree. I agree, hundred percent. By the way, at the time when you said you were cutting, so you you have your studio at the time. You you develop an interest in, in recording as well, not just being a musician. You. Uh, I've always had a keen interest in recording. I mean, from yeah. being a kid, um, the, you know, what really did it for me was uh, I'm going to reference the Beatles again, but uh, yeah. when Paul McCartney released his first solo album, McCartney, um, and when I heard that he played all the instruments, I went, what? And um, I remember my first Wallen sack tape recorder, reel to reel, and it, it did sound on sound. And I'll never forget the first time I harmonized with myself. I went, oh, my goodness. And I've always been fascinated with that. I've almost always wanted to be a recording artist more than live sometimes. I mean, that's just, I've, and ever since then, I've, you know, anything I could do to get near a tape machine. And uh, so I've been recording since I've been 15, 16 years old. Um, you know, I can remember getting my first uh, four track machine or you know then my first eight track machine and then digital came along so I've always recorded always I mean I've got I mean I literally probably have a couple thousand songs on tape I mean I mean a lot of it's crap <laughs> I mean it's probably a, a certain percentage that's that's good but you know that's how you learn you know you would you keep... would you would you release that one day or Somebody need to go through and, and listen to, well, well this I, is great, this is okay. I do. I, I go back through my catalog every now and then. I go, well, that's okay. I'll, I'll rewrite that. Yeah. That, that part of the song, that was a good idea. The rest of it's stupid. But yeah, I, I, I quite often go back and find things that are that I rework. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, sure. how, by the way, how many guitars do you have at home? Man, the, the, the video, the my gear, it's, it's unbelievable. It's uh, you know, very, very well put together. I think I have about 40. I mean, it's which is not that many when you think about it. For somebody who's been playing guitar all my life, I mean, yeah, I have about 40, you know. Some of them are very, very expensive, right? Yeah, so some of them. Yeah, some of them. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a few vintage guitars that are yeah, yeah, yeah. From, from the 50s and 60s that I, you know. Paul Gibson and all the other ones, yeah. Yeah, I've got an old Hofner uh, that I bought in England one time that, you know, like the Beatles used to play back in the cavern days, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, but yeah, yeah. I love, I love guitars. I, I love them to this day. Well, hopefully, you're, yes. Well, I don't know. You cannot tell the kids what to do, right? But it's in a way, it's, you know, I, <laughs> you wish that some of them would take take up the stuff. And uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave them to them. They can do whatever they want with them. You know. Yeah. When, you know. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, well, it's never too late, man. Yeah. <laughs> plus, plus, you know, if you if you're a recording engineer, you don't you don't have to play, right? You need to have a great ear and sound stuff. Like that. You don't need well, to. Learn I, the ball. I yeah, I think I think I've developed an ear over the years just from listening to records and and like I said, recording all these years. I I have developed an ear. Um, Hmm. I, I, a lot of times I don't really know what I'm doing technically. I just know from I and twist the knobs and move the faders until it sounds right to me, you know. But I have learned uh, almost uh, what not to do, you know. Yeah, you know, it, 
a lot of times less is more for making a good sounding recording. You know, don't overdo it. Um, you can muddy things up pretty fast if you're not careful. And, and, that, and I still do that. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll work on a song and I'll put all kinds of parts on it. And then I'll, later I'll come back and go, oh, you overdid it on that one. You don't need all that stuff. And then I'll pull it back and shape it, you know, so to speak. Carve it, as they call it sometimes, to carve it out. Yeah. Yeah. At this time, Coffin is a very famous guy. Um, in uh, he won several Grammys and never met the guy. And he moved to Los Angeles when I was a, a baby, I think. I, Young kid, I don't remember. Umberto Gatica. What's his name? Umberto Gatica. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I've heard that. Yes. Yeah, he's very well known. He won several Grammys. So maybe I should get a hold of the guy, ping it then to the yeah. for the show. Umberto, yeah, I remember him for sure. Yeah, he's very famous. I have no, yeah, because I don't know it. I don't know that much about that particular job. I, I cannot tell the difference between a good sound record engineer versus a bad one. Um, the only point of reference, because I buy whatever is on the market, right? Yeah. But a good point of reference is uh, Stephen Wilson. Yeah. Who has taken everybody's stuff, and I want to do, you know, the my, you know, from for Led Zeppelin, for Pink Floyd, from yeah, too many bands at Chicago, and the the Stephen Wilson version, and and he's 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 very good, right? because I can listen three, I have three or four different versions of. So, that CD and I can tell the difference, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, I've, I've often thought that um, if if you if you can't tell the difference when it's great, then they're doing their job right. <laughs> um, you know, good editing and good producing is 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 a subtle thing, but you know, in the end, it's uh, yeah. I don't know. Like I said, I, I'm guessing a lot myself, but um, I, I think I know a certain amount. I, I know enough to make something sound good. Yeah. Uh, another two songs. Uh, Love you more. Uh, yeah, I wrote that for my wife last year. Um, yeah, beautiful. Kind of, beautiful. I, thank you. I'm I'm proud of that one. Um, to be honest with you, it was, you know, every once in a while, songwriting is hard. Um, uh, in general, it's hard. I can I can sit down at a piano, and I or a guitar, and I can come up with chords, and a melody pretty easy. Um, but lyrics, lyrics are hard, and um, but that one came out really easy. I mean, it was just it flowed right out of me. I mean, I I literally had that written in about a half hour. Um, it, really? it it took me a day or two to record it, but but the lyrics I I wrote them really fast. They just they were so natural, and probably because it's authentic. It's you know I was writing a a song for my wife on her birthday, and, and it just it just flowed out of me. So yeah, thank you. I'm I'm proud of that one. I really am. Yeah, well, tell hello to your wife. If there, if for in general, musician, they do the lyrics and then the music they do at the same time. Like Mike McDonald, like he pick up guitar and start making the stuff up. Is well, I'm I mostly do the music first. The lyrics come later, and I think you'll find that's pretty much the majority. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I I I sometimes I have an idea for a lyric, and I'll and I'll hash out the lyrics for a chorus, and then I'll build a song around that. But, uh, I, you know, I saw Paul McCartney talk about this just the other day. And he says, after all these years of writing, he still doesn't understand how it happens. Because if there is a certain magic to it. It's like, I'll hear a melody and sometimes words will just come out and I have no idea what they mean. And, but they sound right. Yeah. And, and then so then I'll go, well, what does that mean? And then I'll build a song around what I'm hearing and then it starts to make sense. Um, but yeah, generally I like to write the music first. Um, you, you play piano too, no just guitar, right? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I, write, I, I write about 50-50. 50-50, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I love writing on piano because um, there's, you, there's just so, much, so many more possibilities to me. Uh, you, know, you, can just, you can go more places than you can on a guitar, in my opinion. Um, mm. yeah, but and it almost more melodic, but and and I and I love transposing stuff that I've written on piano over to guitar. That's like that's really great because it makes the guitar more interesting to me too, and yeah. vice versa, vice versa. Yeah. So another song, the the world around me. What a beautiful song that is to have. Thank that that thank you that, that that's uh, 
the world around me. Yeah, that's it. I'm trying to remember that one. <laughs> so many, too many songs to remember. But that's thank, right, you. thank you. Beautiful. Thing. What about if you can go over the, the making of the, the Blue Obsession with yeah. Michael? Yeah, that, that yeah. actually Beautiful Child was written during that project and it, it didn't make yeah. a Blue Obsession, but yeah. that started, I've, I've got to, I'll try to make it short, but um, I, we were still living in Los Angeles and Mike told me he had an idea for a blues song, like a blues rock song. And he said, I kind of want to make it sort of like, sort of Jimi Hendrix, like all out sort of rock blues song. And I went, okay, that's interesting. So he came over to my house and, and he showed me the, the, the main figure. Dun, 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 dun. He had that on piano. And I went, okay. So I set up a drum loop that we could play to a rhythm and I picked up my bass. And then we started writing the chords and we hashed out the chords to it. And I came up with some ideas with it as well, but there was no lyric and he wasn't singing or anything. And this is when I knew Mike was not human. Um, again, he, again, he goes, so we built up a track and I didn't, I don't think I put guitar on it. I think it was just keyboard, drum loop and bass. And he goes, can you just give me a track so I can just throw down the melody and, and just so we have, can we remember it for later? And I went, okay. So I gave him the track and I'm not exaggerating this at all. He sang the entire song word for word as it appears now. All in his head, nothing was written down. And, in the world. and, I, and that's what I said. I, after he did it, I went, where did that come from? And he goes, well, I don't know, I just had it in my head. You know, I've had it in my head for a while. And I went, I, I, what, what, who are you? Yeah. And, you know, and, and it was like, and it's a brilliant lyric. It really is. Oh, and, of course. Yeah. and so then we left it at that. And he goes, and I said, well, do you mind if I play with the track a little bit and kind of build a track around it? And he goes, no, go, go for it. So I went in there and I, I, I put in some guitars, which is kind of a Hendrix feel. And, and played a drum track to it, put down new bass. And I think I put down an organ track as well. <clears throat> and, I, and I was pretty happy with it. So then we went and did it. We went back on the road up to Santa Rosa, California. And I said, Mike, I've got, I've got a, a version. You want to hear it? And I was really nervous about it. And so I gave him, we still had Walkmans at this time. This was like 1995 or something. And so I gave him my Walkman and he put the headphones on. We were in the van. I remember we had just finished sound check and we were heading back to the hotel. So the whole band was in the car and he puts the phones on and uh, I won't swear because he said something, but he yeah. puts it on and he goes, and he's listening to it and I could hear it in his headphones, but I was really nervous. And he goes, this is effing great. This is effing great. And he pulls it out, pulls the headphones on and he goes, put this in the tape machine in the car thing and he puts it in the car cassette machine blasts it and he goes oh, this is unbelievable i can't believe this he just loved it and the whole band in front of the whole band it was like i can't tell you how exhilarated i was and um, oh, and that started the album blue obsession because the song was called obsession blues but he wanted to call the album blue obsession kind of a twist on it and that song started it was the nucleus of that record so then, uh, not long after that, he moved to Nashville, um, which was kind of weird because I had moved to Nashville because of Michael. And uh, anyway, or actually, I take that back. I wasn't in Nashville yet. I was, he had moved to Nashville. I was still in Los Angeles. And he kept saying, you know, you got to come out to Nashville and write. We'll, we'll write some more. And I think you'd like it out here. And I was coming, well, Nashville, really? So we went out to Nashville. I went out and... Uh, he got a place down on Music Row, they call it down here, 17th, 16th. And it's just a, an area of Nashville. It's all old homes that are converted into production houses where they write, where songwriters write and record. And um, so we, we went into this room and he had another song idea and he knew the title was gonna be called No Love To Be Found. And I went, okay. So he had, he had the song idea and we just started writing. and. Again, it was a very 50-50 thing. I'd throw a lyric out at him. And I came up with the bridge, which I, I, I was thinking kind of Tom Petty at the time, because the song was in a minor 
a minor blues thing, but I thought, well, what if we kind of went major and got big and regal for the bridge? And he was like, what? And uh, it worked and he really liked it. So we wrote that and then all of a sudden we were, he started playing these other chords and I started playing along with them and we wrote another song while we were writing that one and that's called Someday You Will. And it turned out to be about a, a, a friend of ours who was actually a childhood friend of, my, of Mike's, his name was Chuck Sabatino, who had had a stroke. And I think at this time he was still living, but he was incapacitated and could no longer be in the band. And it was devastating to all of us. So we wrote this song, two songs in one day, No Love That We Found and uh, Someday You Will. And uh, so then we had to, uh, the fourth song came later, but uh, build upon it. But uh, so that was the nucleus of Blue Obsession. And I was still living in Los Angeles, so I went home. And then they, he hired Tommy Sims as a producer for the record. And they went on and they cut a bunch of other great stuff for that record. But he was on Reprise Records at the time, or Reprie, whatever you call it, part of Warner Brothers. And they dropped him. They dropped Mike. They, they let him go. Like, really? Yeah, they dropped him. They decided not to pick up his contract. And it was like, oh, you're kidding. And this album was done. And um, so the album was in the can. It was like, went on the shelf. And it was like, are you kidding me? And Mike was, I kept talking to Mike about it. And Mike said, yeah, it looks like it's not going to go anywhere. And, and um, then he talked about putting it out himself. And I said, Mike, I'll help you finish the record for nothing. But we got to put this record out. And so I flew back here to Nashville and we wrote Build Upon It and we went in and, and recorded a bunch of other songs and he put it out on his own label, which he formed with Jeff Bridges and uh, another guy named Chris Polonis called uh, Ramp Records. Um, and the record came out. Um, I think partly thanks to me because I pushed Mike to finish it. And I think it's one of Mike's greatest records. I mean, I love all his stuff, but I think it's one of his most unique records. Um, I really do. Oh, and, I have I have several questions. So first, congratulations. Number two is, is um, you mentioned something very very important that Michael mentioned many times. You know, go for it, go for it. You know, try a different way. Or you surprise the guy. You were nervous, but you. It, with some, I I I don't know. As, as I say before, right? I don't know your world, your world, but uh, with many musicians, you don't have the opportunity to do that, right? So. You know, they hire to do, I hire you to do 40 gigs. This is how you're going to play. That's the way you're going to address it. You know, play to my guitar, play to my piano, play to my liver. I don't care. Yeah. You, you have a very good, very good and significant relation, like maybe, you know, brother to brother or father to son or whatever with Michael that yeah. he knows you enough now, right? That, yeah, Mike is, he's, you know, he's, show me your most, stuff. he's the most unegocentric person I know. You know, really? he, he almost, uh, you know, he almost downplays himself. You know, he doesn't think he's a very good keyboard player. You know, he, he rags on his own voice sometimes. It's like, yeah. you know, he needs encouragement too, just like the rest of us, you know. Um, and I, and I, I try to remember that because I, you know, he, just because he's Michael McDonald, he's still human. He's still got emotions. Um, he's got doubts, self-doubts, just like anybody, you know. Really? Oh, absolutely. you know, absolutely. He's uh, he knows what he wants. You know, he he's got a very clear vision of what he what he wants. But he, at the same time, he's very he thinks he thinks this stuff is terrible sometimes. And it's like, Mike, come on, stop it. You know, I love your stuff. You know, so he needs encouragement, just like all of us. He really does. So I'm grateful that he does trust me. Um, and, you know, he's not afraid to tell me if he doesn't like something, too, you know. And I've developed a state where I can be honest with him and say, you know, Mike, I think this part's going on a little too long. Maybe you need to shorten that a little bit. Yeah, so go and he'll go, he'll go, oh, yeah, you're right. Or he'll say, no, I, I like it that way. You know, we can, we can be honest with each other. And that, that's healthy. You know, you don't want to be a yes man, you know. And he doesn't want yes man. You know, he wants, he wants, he wants honesty, too, you know, of course, you know. And then it was difficult to put, I suppose, when you need to go on your own, right? Put the record together as your own label. It's, it's a, I imagine that's a difficult process. You need to put up the money and- We have. 
Absolutely. I saw Mike go through that with Blue Obsession. Um, I mean, let's let's face it. They're, you know, record companies, when they put records out, they spend a lot of money to promote it and to, and they, you know, there is definitely such a thing as payola, you know, they pay radio stations to play your stuff, you know. Yeah. So Mike, Mike with his own uh, record company, <laughs> that was in his court, you know, he had to like support his record. Yeah, he spent a lot of money on promoting that record. And I think he made most of it back, but that was a struggle for him. Absolutely. Um, he since went on and did, now he's got his own label without those partners. And I think it's, uh, but he, then he signed with Motown and did those records. So, you know, he kind of found a, it's easier to have another record company put up the money, let's put it that way. You know? And then they do the promotion, the contact rates, and they do all the marketing, advertising, you, you just play. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Blue Obsession, that was a hard one to promote. Um, it did sell well, uh, regardless, you know, it, it sold well, but uh, I think it would have done better if it was still on Reprieve, you know. Um, but it's a great record. And I think he's talking about doing a, a reissue of that record um, at some point here with uh, with either Universal or Motown, which would be great. <laughs> yeah, wow. I, I don't know if you do you know Steve Hackett stuff well or? Uh, yeah, yeah. He has a very good album that I like it, blue stuff. I like Jeff. I like rock and well, as I say before, I I like many types of different music for many different reasons. So there is one album, a blues album that that he did, that he did a long time ago, and I mentioned that album in the interview that I did with him uh, two months ago. It's a very good album, man. I, I yeah, I can, I, can, I can send it your way, man. I'll, you I'll, like yeah, I'll, I'll check it out definitely. Yeah, I'm always I'm always uh. It's very good stuff. Very good. More than willing to buy people's records because it's that's what it's all about, supporting each other, you know. Right. So then you moved to Nashville. Uh, were you married at the time? Was yeah. Yeah, we my wife and I have been married for almost 30 years. Um yeah, that was uh that was that was that was a, a big deal, thing. right? It was a very big deal because you know I'm a California boy, I've been there all my life, and so was she. Yeah. And we you know, we brought I brought her and the kids out here first and we we kind of visited and visited. Right out, right out, right. And and she, she liked it. Um, I think it was it was appealing to her because of the lifestyle. I mean, for our kids raising a family, and you know that's the great thing about Nashville is you can be a musician here and actually make a living and support yourself and support your family, as opposed to being in California. It's very hard. Uh, it's expensive there, and it's not getting any cheaper. So yeah, that and and the school district was great. We could get a, a great house for the money. Um, so yeah, it, it it was a big move. I mean, it was a very scary thing. I mean, we we drove from California to here, you know, um, and I remember the whole way going, "What am I doing?" Uh, but you know, we, we we've really actually really grown to love it here, um, and we've been here twenty, almost twenty three years, almost. Yeah, it's hard to believe. Uh, yeah. I don't. I've never been in in that part of the country. And uh, somehow, sorry my ignorance, but I I, I do respect country music. And I don't know that much about it, but somehow I think, although I've never been there, right, that I wouldn't like living there because I don't like the kind of uh, that type of music. Maybe I'm wrong, but here, right here is in in where I live, right. Mm -hmm. I'm in Virginia, 10 minutes from, uh, no, 20 minutes from Maryland and then 20 minutes to DC. Yeah. Which is the, every band, every good band come to this area. So yeah, I mean, yeah. that's why I'm able to see every single band that everybody comes here. We played, the, we played the Birch Mirror there a lot in of that course, area. Yeah, I've been many times. Yeah, I saw you last night. Yeah. I was there too. The Birch Mirror is a beautiful place. So Yeah, I love it. I got to open for my <laughs> Huh? I got to open for Mike there one time. I with my just my acoustic guitar. I did a like a thirty minute set opening for Mike there. That was fun. What was that like? Four years ago? Longer than that. Longer than that. Oh, yeah. It was my. It was on my birthday. I remember. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was probably ten or ten years ago. Maybe a little more than that. Oh, I got you. Got you. Yeah. So that's the reason I 
I don't know anything about Dashville. That I don't know if I like it or not. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm. No, it's I, a I understand what you're saying because I know a lot of people say that to me. It's you know, it's um, yeah. The music scene is very dominated by country, but more than that, it's more dominated by songwriters, and those songwriters actually, and a lot of a lot of big acts come here to produce their records. Not country people, but rock acts and gospel acts and even yeah. jazz jazz acts you know it's a yeah. it's a, there's a lot of music here a lot of different types of music and a lot of night uh, uh, a lot of nightclubs that play all kinds of music like there's a there's a club here called third and Lindsley and uh, a friend of mine Bill Lloyd who's a great songwriter uh, they have a thing called uh, the long players and they they do uh, albums in their entirety. Like they'll do uh, the Beatles White Album and they'll do every song from the very first song to the last and they'll, they'll reproduce them and they'll have different singers come in and sing each song. I did one last year where they did Abbey Road. And um, so yeah, there, there, there's a lot of different kind of music here. There really is. It, it's, um, and it's really grown. I mean, uh, Nashville is very metropolis. It's very, it's, it's really, really growing. There's a lot of uh, uh, downtown, uh, living there now. They have high rise, uh, you know, flats where people live. It's, it's pretty modern, pretty cutting edge. I mean, Google's here. They're, I think one of their headquarters is here. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Dell computers. It's, you know, it's, it's their headquarters is here. It's, it's, it's really, really grown since I've been here. And so, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. I mean, in, in, in even the, um, I won't, I won't get into politics even, but even that is a little hard for me sometimes because, uh, you know, it's my views are a little different than the majority here. But you go into Nashville and it's it's a lot different, um, but it's actually pretty, pretty diverse here. It really is, especially Nashville proper. It's very mm -hmm. diverse. It really is. Are there many places like the Bishmer, uh, um, like, not the Bishmer, but the Waltrop? Well, uh, the Ryman Auditorium, for instance, Ryman huh? the Ryman Auditorium, yeah. uh, which is a legendary uh, concert hall. They have everybody there. I mean, everybody. I mean, Crosby, Stills and Nash, you know, Michael, uh, Elvis Costello. I mean, everybody you can think of has played there. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of venues here that, that, that a lot of music, a lot of different kind of diverse music. But, uh, Nashville's a, a major stop for major tours. I mean, they come through here. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. I should check it out. They same from Austin, Texas, right? It's a lot of Austin. music town. Right? Austin's kind of similar. Austin's a little more rootsy than Nashville, maybe, but um, but yeah, it's that's that's a good comparison. They're, it's similar. It is. Austin's. Uh, I'm good friends with Christopher Cross, um, and he lives there. He's a he's an Austin guy. You know, yeah. he, he loves it there. I love his music too, man. It. Uh, Man, I have a lot of questions. I don't know if you, how long do you have time or? I'm okay. I'm all right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, it's any any artist that, um, as I said before, I'm always looking for new people, and um, and I'm, I'm quite sure after this, I'm going to ping you if you can recommend me some people. Any any artist that we should that we should uh, check out. You know my style. You listen to my radios and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. you probably know more than I do. I mean, gosh, I'd have to think about that for a second. Um, you, can, you can send me an email later on. You know, check check this guy, check the guy, and I will. I'm always looking for new people to to bring it to uh, uh, to you know to, to have an interview with them, right? So yeah, getting a hold of I don't know the big names that. Um, you might be interested. You might be interested in Dylan. I mean, Mike's son. He's. Oh yeah, definitely. I will. I will check him out. He's a, he's a really good, really good guy. Very bright, smart, uh, just and a funny guy. He's he's a really good guy, but he's very talented. Um, he's really. Good. You should check out his music. He's really good. Yeah, I will check it out. I grow myself and all that. As mentioned before, it's it's hard. It's difficult to be the son of somebody because you need to. I don't know. Everybody always compare you. I'm, I'm different now. Well, another, better or worse, but I'm different, right? So. Yeah, another band to check out is maybe is um, a, a band that I produced. Um, they're called Midtones, and uh, they're uh, they're really good. Um, 
I don't think they have a website per se, but I could send you their music. What I, kind I, of stuff? What type of music? Is it? It's kind of um, it's sort of alter, alternative rock. Um, it's different. It's different. It's a. Uh, yeah, we'll check it out. Yeah, they, they, they kind of remind me maybe of uh, a little bit of Smashing Pumpkins or yeah, you know, um, but it's good. It's it's intelligent lyrics, um, melodic, and they they play with a lot of passion. Really good stuff. Yeah, I want to give it. What are your top? If I don't know, I want to say something stupid, but if you have five days to live and and God, you know, give you any 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 wish or your life, five people that you wish you have the opportunity to play in your life, and five vinyl, nothing vinyl that you can take to a, an island before you die or whatever. Well, <laughs> I of course, you don't die, but of course, Beatles is there. The Beatles, yeah. Yeah, any, anything by the Beatles, um, especially, uh, I'm really looking forward to this uh, Peter Jackson reboot of Let It Be, which is called Get Back. Yeah. <clears throat> it's coming out next year. <clears throat> uh, Joni Mitchell is really high on my list. I'm, I'm just a huge Joni Mitchell fan. Um, gosh, uh, I, I, I love uh, I love Toto. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm good friends. I'm proud to say I'm good friends with Steve Lukather. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, he's he's a sweetheart. We did a tour with them back in 2013, 2014, where we co-build with them. And boy, it was a little intimidating being on the same stage with uh, with Steve Lukather because uh, to me, in my eyes, he's like the greatest guitar player that ever lived. But uh, really, he's just a super sweet guy and very supportive and of his fellow players. And uh, yeah, Toto would be another one. Um, That's that's three. Let me think. I, I love Cro uh, David Crosby's a big, uh, yeah. big hero of mine. Stephen Stills, that whole genre of music I really love. Uh, Stevie Wonder, Stevie Wonder, I it would have to be on that list. You know, that's five. At yeah. least five, you know, I could go another five, five after that. But so. I don't know. I don't know if you have the opportunity, but uh, one of the first interviews I did was with Simon Phillips. Oh yeah, I know Simon. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you have the chance to watch the interview, but uh, yeah, I'll, he's a I'll, watch. I'll watch that. Very yeah. good guy, and on, somehow all the British people that have done interview with them, um, they're very good people. They're they're very different than Americans. Uh, yeah. Uh, very humble, you know, from Steve Hackett, from Simon Phillips, for uh, uh, Anthony Phillips from Genesis too, and. Yeah. Very good people, and many, many others they have done, and uh, yeah, yeah. very different Americans. Some, you know, I, I hope, I hope uh, Steve Lukather is not listening to stuff, but somehow I, I picture him. Of course, he never met the guy, he never talked to the guy, but I picture more than more than like an arrogant person. And uh, maybe I'm wrong, but no, I, I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd use the word arrogant. I, I know what you're saying, but <clears throat> he come across to me, to me, <clears throat> like like a group of the, I'm above everybody else, and the. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong because I would love to have an interview with the guy. But uh, Steve yeah. has a he has a heart of gold. He really does. Really? Yeah. He, he's a very loving. I mean, every time I see him, he hugs me, and you know, I mean, he, he kisses me on the cheek. I mean, he's just uh, wow. Yeah, but he's a family man. But I, I can see what you're saying. He's he's not shy about his opinions or telling you what he thinks. Um, I mean, he's he manages Toto now. Because, yeah, he he manages them because he 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 didn't think anybody could do it right, so he he took control. Um, yeah, he he's de he can definitely be brash, and he's he's not one to hold back uh, profanities, <laughs> or uh, but I, I can I can guarantee you, uh, speaking from experience, he's he's a very loving, sweet man. He really is. I, 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 He's really, 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 really nice guy. And I mean, maybe maybe other people he's not nice to, but he's nice to me um, every time I've seen him. Like we went and saw them a couple of years ago, my wife and I in, uh, uh, where was that? Somewhere in, somewhere in Atlanta, I think, I think it was. Oh no, maybe it was, uh, I can't remember where it was, somewhere, somewhere down south of yeah. us. And, um, He brought me backstage and it was just me and my wife and him backstage hanging out and talking. We sat there back there for an hour and just talked about anything, you know. He, he's really, um, 
I think he likes to be just regular, you know, but he's, he's a rock star, you know, no, no two ways about it. He's kind of a rock star. And I think that's, you know, that's part of his persona, you know? Yeah. And As I, I said before, uh, maybe I'm completely wrong. That's the, that's the opinion that I have the guy looking at from my eyes, which is very different to where you are. Yeah. The same Not opinion with uh, uh, the Kim Crimson guy, right? Interview two so far. And I wanted to get a hold of Robert Free, and the same opinion. I have the opinion of Robert Free that he's a tough guy and kind of arrogant. And and one one of the guys I interviewed, he told me he's like a it is it's hard on the outside, but mushy on the inside. Once mm -hmm. you get to know the guy and relax guy, relax with you, he's very funny and, and a nice person. But well, that's a good point. I think that um I think it's a matter of insecurity sometimes, you know, people put on a front, you know, because they're insecure of being in public and, you know, once you get to know them, I mean, I can, I can speak from experience, I, you know, a handful of celebrities that I played with that are not the most pleasant people and I'm not going to name any names, but, but, you know, and, and sometimes they'll come off as nice, but when you get to know them, they're not. So, there's the reverse of that as well. So, you know, unfortunately. How I will have a hard time thinking about question interview somebody who half the way they interview, I say, what the heck, this guy is it's a prick, it's an arrogant, what I'm doing here, what I'm wasting my time, or he's wasting his time with me. Yeah. Because the opinion that I may have of certain people may be very different when you get to know them, right? I All these people I can mention, I, I, I know them as a mistake you know, as artists, right? I buy the music. I, I put them the music in the radio, right? But have no idea how they are in real life. Maybe they're real I, us, you know? That's an unfortunate feeling. I, I One of my heroes, yeah. uh, I got to meet one time and he turned out to be a complete jerk. And it, it disappointed me because I'm so spiritually connected to his music. Yeah. I got to meet him later and he was nicer. Um, I'm just going to say it was Todd Rundgren. And... Yeah, and, Todd, yeah, he's a good guy to you. But... but, but, and he was really nice to me later. I think this first time it was just, he just was in a bad mood and I happened to get the brunt end of it. And it was just, it was unpleasant. It shattered me because he's one of my main influences. He's another guy I would take to the island with me. You know, I love his music. And, um, but he turned out to be a nice guy in the end, I think, you know. By the way, now that Steven look at here and, and then Todd, be playing with Ringo, have you met Ringo or? I did meet Ringo. Yes, I did. Uh, what about the other, the other two? That was because of Steve Lukather. <laughs> because 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 Steve Steve was playing with us and and he you know he was playing with Ringo, and he would tell me Ringo stories and I go, man, I've never met a Beatle. I would love to meet him. He goes, just call me next time. We're I'll, I'll hook you up. And I went, okay. And he did. We went. I remember we went to St. Louis to see him, and we got backstage. And they guided us backstage and Steve met me and it was in a room of maybe 10 people, 15 people. That was it. And Ringo came in and I'll never forget. It, it was like, Oh my God, there's Ringo. And, uh, yeah. and Ringo came right over to Steve and very personable and Ringo shook my hand and he was so warm and generous. And, and Luke, Luke made that happen. Oh. He made, he made that happen. And I'll never forget it. Uh, Steve goes, yeah, Bernie plays guitar for Michael McDonald. And he goes, and Ringo goes, oh, really? He goes, uh, you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, yes. <laughs> and we all laughed. But, it, you, know, you know, that's, Luke made that happen. So he's, he's, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, he's, he's, he's blessed in my book from forever, you know. Yeah. For me, the, the, as you know, for the stuff on the radio, I, in many ways, I never thought that I will put this project together and then do phase two, phase three, and launch another another radio. And, mm -hmm. and I wanted to, in many ways, you know, close the circle, right? I have admiration for so many musicians because music is so important to me. But a lot of people ask me the same thing. Are you playing an instrument? No, I don't. Have you played? No, I have no interest. Do you know how to read me? No, I just began listening to music when I was a baby and my son, it's the same. So I, I want to close the loop and, and I talk to these people that I have that I admire because I 
I like the music from I, I, Pink I, Floyd, I, from Peter Gabriel, from Pan Metheny, and blah blah blah. And some of them, of course, because some, you know, I'm, I'm those are online radio, and I'm not the BBC. Or hopefully, one day, and uh, I, I want to meet this guy. You know, have like a normal, no need, no need to be a conversation. You know, tell me the good stuff. Tell me about the bad stuff in a decision. And a talk, and then, you know, put the interview there for people. To listen to like i would have listened if thank this god, radio existed and thank god for that i mean I, I you know i i have another friend that has a similar view on music that you do he yeah. just loves music you know he's always sharing stuff but he doesn't play it, uh, anything you know but he loves it and he feels it i mean music is a is a as a thing that moves us you know moves our spirit moves it's uh, it's important you know it's very important and like peter jackson redoing this this Beatle thing, it's like, yeah, he's not a musician, but you know, he's doing it because he loves it. And of course, he's gonna make money, of course, but yeah. nothing wrong with that, you know. No, of course, you need to make a living. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, if you want to talk about their their your new CD one day? Maybe, maybe one, one day. day. I think. Maybe one day. Yeah, that was basically I wrote I wrote most of it during, you know, shelter in place, lockdown, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And there's 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 a few songs that are directly about isolation, and uh, one song's called "New Normal," which is you know obviously it's just a, you know my feelings about dealing with this new world that we're, we've been dealing with, and there's there's some political stuff in there too. Um, you know I don't know if we need to get into that, but um, you know these last four years have been difficult, um, and so. And then there's there's love songs and there's, but most all of it was recorded all in these last since uh, March, up through September. Um, I, I like to think of it. I, I say this about every record that I do, but I like to think it's my best so far. Uh, I may think that later of that later, but I, I I feel really good. And a lot of my friends have told me this is the best thing you've done. Um, so I'm happy with it. I'm already working on another one, and I think it's better than the last ones. Yeah, I would need to, I, I have not had the chance to listen to that because I don't have it, but- um, I'll send it to you, I'll send it yeah, to you. Yeah, that would be good. I uh, would love to listen. And uh, of course, <clears throat> two observation there. You gotta think that way. You need to, You need. if you thought that wasn't as good and the one before, you're gonna put it out. Of course, so you, psychologically, you need to think that that's the best work you've ever done. Well, you know, right? that, and, and like, again, Paul McCartney, I'm gonna reference him again, but I heard him say recently, he goes, I, I feel like I haven't written my best song yet. And it's like, really? <laughs> Yesterday, yeah. you know. But uh, but you know that just that just kind of proves the point. I, I, as an artist, you're always striving to be better. I mean, Picasso painted the same thing pretty much the later part of his life. He was trying to get it right. You know, um, I think we're always striving to be better. Paint to be, and people pay a hundred million dollars for painting. And sometimes I don't understand. Yeah. Like, how is somebody? I don't know if I can have them. If I did have the amount of money, Bernie, I would do something good in society. There's yeah. nothing wrong making money for yourself and a house, a car. And, you know, you earn it. Yeah. But if something wrong, is that's the only thing you do. Yeah, yeah, like, I, I agree. Like Bill, I work for Microsoft, right? Bill Gates donates a lot of money. You know, Elon Musk is going to be donated. But there are some people that they are not like that. They they, they want to accumulate, accumulate that. They don't do anything good for society. What's the point of doing that? Man? Yeah. Uh, in I could think of one guy who uh, is in the White House right now that fits of that. Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I won't you, go any further than that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, uh, I, 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 you have. We have the same political views, man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, well, we have a new president in 30 days from now, and she need to change this. This this country, you know, it, it has gone down the toilet the last four years. Yeah, he and his family, they're all a bunch of scumbags and. The whole world doesn't respect the United States. Look at us as a joke. Yeah. You know, the president walk out for any important treaty in the world, important stuff. According to him, climate climate is not a big deal. And I would like to I would like to interview the guy because I will ask him very difficult questions. I'm I mean, I'm a very nice person, Bernie, but I can be mean when I want to be. I mean, right now. I can I can relate to what you're saying right now. You know, the irony in all this to me, I think about that a lot is you know, this whole thing about a fraudulent election coming from a guy that couldn't be more of a fraud. 
course, he's a fraud yeah. to begin with. His his middle name is fraud. The whole family is fraud. Mm -hmm. The injustice to black people where white cops got away because he's a white. I, I, I wonder if it was the other way around. How many years, you know, uh, yeah. a black cop will, will get into it. it, it yeah, I, in a way, I wish to be a, a judge because I will look that those people are not not being partial, or maybe he's partial, but the evidence that's presented to, I, you know, I I wish in many ways I I was born in this I had born been born in this country when I have an accent, we have gone to a top school in the country, uh, like I did, and then and then I will I will make my own name because I will have like a show, and then in. You know, I, I'm telling. I will tell the people. You know, I'm right front. I'm going to ask you a lot of difficult questions. So think yeah. about twice if you want to come to the show. But if you are, you know, be honest with me. And if you are not answering the question, I will ask the question again. Yeah, yeah. I'm not offend you, but I will say you have at least know what I asked you. Yeah, Please, and that's so. And, and, uh, it should be. They, they would hope. You know, they gotta be transparency and and uh, yeah. Yeah, anyway, yeah. That's. Then, Yes. So, um, where where people can buy your music? Um, in your oh. website, you have a website where I have a website, BernieShareValley.com. Got a yeah. music page with all my records up there, and you know, you can buy the CDs and, or you can, uh, you know, all the digital outlets, iTunes. Unfortunately, uh, the the streaming age is, is is hurt us with with sales a little bit. Sorry, that's Adam. Okay. Um, um, you know, it, uh, all the digital outlets, you know, it's pretty much uh, anywhere you can find digital music, you can find my music, Amazon, iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, all of it. It's all there. If people uh, in the website can buy vinyls as well or not? Or just I, haven't, I haven't done, I haven't done a vinyl in a long time. I mean, my yeah. the band page one I told you about, we did vinyl years ago, but it's, it's pretty expensive to to do vinyl and in order to recover the investment yeah the band uh midtones i was telling you about they did a vinyl record which is kind of neat that it, but um you know unless you're somebody like a big artist it's really not worth it um I, I, you know you're, you're gonna lose money if you do it just to do it it's fine i guess but um i i i can i can pay for my records by people buying cds which is nice and i do have a, a fan base enough that I usually sell out of the CDs every time I uh, order them. So. What do you think? Yeah. So, how's it? You I noticed your website. You have like a uh, a Patreon section. That is, yeah, Patreon is, is, is okay. Is that works, right? Yeah, it, it's fun. You know, I have a small community there, and um, they pay like one to three dollars a month, and I'll I'll play them uh, demos that I'm working on before they're finished, or sometimes I'll do a, a, a recording session and I'll show them how the song is built and take the tracks apart and people really love that um i've got some faithful followers there it, that's fun adam turned me on to that actually my son um yeah. so Dad, you, ought, you ought to do a patreon site and i'm like what's that <laughs> so maybe 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 i will do the uh, Teresa was asking about that is maybe i will do that for the for one of the radios uh yeah yeah but good. for now see for me the thing is i always have the idea that I want to put the money. I already own a lot of music. I'm buying, I'm paying rice to, you know, in order to have a radio, you need to pay a little bit of money. And it's, it's not expensive because since I don't have any income coming in, I'm in the lower tier. Uh, uh, and it's 24 hour a day, no media, no ads, completely free, great yeah. music because I'm very picking the stuff that I uploaded, yeah. upload nightly. And, uh, I want to. I wanted to keep it free as 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 much as I can, right? That's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and then 90 percent is music. The other ten percent is talking to people. Let me see yourself, right? You never see an ad from Coca Cola or nothing. Uh, for now, I don't. I don't have any interest to go the commercial way. I want to have the best record with the best music with the best sound all That's over. Right. The world. And That's if people want to contribute on the road, man, that will be. That well, will you, be. Know, you know, that's a great attitude because. As a musician, that I do it for the love of it first. Of course, yeah, right. Um, and that's 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 really the to me that's just the best way to be in life. <laughs> yeah. You know? If the radio become big and um, and I have hundreds of thousands of 
listen on the world. Yeah, they, then I will do like a Patreon where people can contribute one, three, five bucks, and then use some money, you know, to pay for, you know, pay for, for a new ring, pay, pay for itself, right? I, I, exactly. Yeah. And you know, people well, like people like being part of things sometimes, you know, of, par of projects that they 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 helped it happen, you know. That's that's sure. cool. yeah. Definitely, I want to explore that stuff with uh, with Adam to see if you yeah. know. And uh, man, you have been either chair stage or recorded with man, Chaka Khan, Average White Band, Bill Reston, Toto, Christopher Cross. Man, what a name, man. I'm Is any yes, you very, very few musicians you haven't played to, man. Well, yeah, I haven't, I haven't played, I haven't played with the Beatle, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I've been really fortunate. I've been, and 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 some of my call friends, which is neat, you know. That's very good. And, and and the last question is, what kind of music you listen to when you are not when you're in the car driving or you go to the grocery or whatever? What, what kind of stuff you like? Do you buy CDs? Do you buy record or do you buy I, digital I, stuff? I do buy CDs. Um, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna put on my music here just for a second so I can see. Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't I forget sometimes when you're trying to think of it. Come on, what are you doing here? I know I can't see you. Oh, here we go. Grab this article. There we go. Um, let's see. Who do I like? Like I said, I, I still listen to Joni Mitchell. I still listen. I got the new Paul McCartney album, um, which I'm kind of disappointed with, to be honest with you. I think he needs to kind of, who am I to say? But, uh, you know, I think he needs to think about just maybe getting getting into his writing a little deeper or maybe write some with some other people because he's still got the brilliance, but um, I don't know. Too soft. Too softy, he's becoming, yeah. Yeah. Um, I like, uh, I love Jeff Lynn stuff, ELO, Electric Like Orchestra. Yeah. Um, let me look through. Uh, James Taylor, I still really like. Yeah, man, those are big names, man. You know, uh, you know, Judy Collins, uh, I, I love Alison Krauss with, uh, you know, she's country, but not really. Uh, there's a new band called Haim. Are you, are you hip to them at all? No. It's uh, three girls from uh, Los Angeles. They're really good. They're really good. They, 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 write, they play all their, their own instruments and write their own, produce their stuff. They're really good. How do you spell the... the, the... Uh, it's H-A-I-M. It looks like Haim. But it, yeah. it's pronounced high and they're really good. Uh, th their stuff can be a little popish at times, but it's it's. Uh, check it out. Uh, yeah. They're good. They're 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 serious about what they do. Um, you know, and my my kids turn me on to stuff. Adam and you know my Ad Adam and Rachel, they both have totally different tastes in music. Um, <laughs> Adam is more uh, experimental, kind of underground kind of stuff, where Rachel's more pop. She turned me on to uh, Casey Musgraves country but I, I, I love her album it's really good mm -hmm. taylor taylor swift's new stuff i i kind of like um, taylor, yeah, yeah you know you know i'm like like you I, I i like all kinds of music i mean anything that's good that's obviously uh done well i'll, I'll appreciate it you know if it gets me it gets me it doesn't matter what you know it. bands like in in the uk like uh Haya sakai london grammar you know those people a little bit a little bit yeah I uh, should do more. You know, I'm always learning new bands. I just discovered Wilco. Wilco last year. They're very good, yeah. Mm -hmm. What I will do tonight, I will send you a list of top songs that, that are good stuff according to Claudio. Okay. And then you can send, you know, Bernie sent to Claudio, you know, top songs that are good according to him. And then we... And send me your address and I'll send you some some of my CDs. Yeah, I will do that. Mm -hmm. All right, man. So uh, let me uh, let me stop the recording here and then we talk for two minutes. And the okay, sure. Other stuff. Okay. And, uh, well, thank you again for your time, Bernie. That was, and thank you very much again for for the beautiful music, for your honesty. You are a very good and decent guy. And, uh, and you know, my you, pleasure. My pleasure. Buddy. We align our political views, and we have <laughs> a new a new president in twenty days, and we need to turn this country around, man. We uh, will. I, I think. I think. I think Biden is the right guy for the times. I really and do. And hopefully, we'll hire the best people for the job and and get rid of all the nonsense. And he already all, is. He already and, is uh, all the BS and, and everything, man. All right, thank you very much again, man. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. you. And then let me stop that. Then, okay. uh, and then let's stop.